this is our 25th program on Patmos, and I'm very excited to come and speak to you again this morning. We are going to continue speaking about hearing the voice of God. And I'm going to share something amazing with you today that I believe is really going to, to bless you. And you're going to see that God is a, a miraculous God. God is an awesome God. But even more than that, when you see the revelation God wanted to give me, you are going to see how God loves us in the most amazing way. Let's just pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your mercy, your love, and your grace, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you are still the same yesterday, today, and forever, Jesus. And I pray that even as I'm going to speak right now, Lord, that your anointing, your presence will begin to, to touch people, Father, with the truth. Give them revelation, not only in their minds, Lord, but also in their hearts. And that your presence, Lord, will be tangible upon them. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm going to speak about a, a sign that appeared to me in the, on the 8th of April 2014, about seven years ago. This amazing sign appeared to me. And it was a sign that as I was walking outside and I was praying and speaking to the Lord, the Lord has spoken to me often through signs in the heavens. The sign that appeared to me, I took a photo of this because it was so significant that I didn't really know what it was. And finally, when I had it on my computer and I looked at it, I suddenly realized what it was. And I was amazed when I saw what God had shown me. And so what I saw looked very strange. And the thing that really caught my attention was that when I looked up in the sky, I saw something that looked like it was beaten by a hammer. You know, when, a, when steel or any metal is beaten by a hammer, it makes these little dents on the, on the metal. So I saw that, and, but I didn't know what it was. But as I had it on my computer and I looked at it, I saw what it was. And I was really amazed to see what it was. So in order to confirm that I did see what I saw, I went to do a research in the Bible on hammered, the word hammered. Because that's exactly what I saw. So I found in, in Exodus 25 verse 8, this amazing verse where God tells Moses to basically build the tabernacle and to, to put everything in the tabernacle and then also to, to build an Ark of the Covenant. And it says here in verse 8, Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them and make it according to all that I show you the pattern of the tabernacle or the dwelling and the pattern, pattern of the furniture of it. And they shall make the ark, that's the ark of the covenant of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. And you shall overlay the ark with pure gold inside and out, and make a crown of gold and a rim or a border around it, its top. And you shall cast four rings and cast the, uh, them to the four corners of it, two rings on either side. And you shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold and put the poles through the rings on the side by which it can be carried. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark and they shall not be removed for that um, the ark not be touched. And you shall put inside of the Ark of the Testimony the Ten Commandments and which I will give you. So I just want to stop right here. So what God told Moses, he told Moses, you need to build an Ark of the Covenant. And so the first part was the box and the box was overlaid with gold. And then he had to take four corners and put rings on it and put two poles through the Ark of the Covenants. And then these Two poles, they had to carry the Ark of the Covenant like this so that they would not touch the Ark of the Covenant. And they were also overlaid with gold. Right. Then in verse 17, he continues and he says, And you shall make the mercy seat of pure gold, two cubits and a half long and a cubit and a half wide. And you shall make the two cherubim or the two winged angelic figures of a solid 
hammered gold on the two ends of the mercy seat and make one cherub on each end, making the cherub of one piece with the mercy seat on the two ends. So this is quite amazing. When I made this discovery, I was amazed because what it says, you shall now make a mercy seat. Now, what is the mercy seat? The mercy seat is the part that covered the box on top of the uh, ark. And so this was made of one solid hammered piece of gold. The two cherubim, as well as the mercy seat, had to be one solid hammered piece of gold. Hallelujah. There is what I saw. So when I saw the sign and when I looked at it, I saw that it was the top part of the Ark of the Covenant, which was made of one solid hammered piece of gold. Now, that's quite amazing. Why would God show me the top part of the Ark of the Covenant? You know, the box was completely gone. And so when we speak about hearing the voice of God, verse 20, it says, And the cherubim shall spread out the wings above and cover the mercy seat with their wings, facing each other, looking down towards the mercy seat. And you shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and the ark shall, and in the ark shall you put the testimony or the Ten Commandments that I give you. There I will meet with you from above the mercy seat between the two cherubim that are upon the testimony, I will speak intimately with you, which I will give the commandments to Israel. So God is saying this was the place where he would speak to us above the mercy seat, between the wings of the cherubim, right here. God said this is the place where he would speak to us intimately. Hallelujah. This is an amazing revelation God wanted to give us. And when I got this, I was amazed at this sign because I was blown away, but why did God show me this? So when I began to, to pray about it, God reminded me. One day he showed me a vision. And in the vision, I had seen uh, a pole with two curtains. And the curtains were hanging down. And when I saw this vision, the Holy Spirit immediately spoke to me and said to me, The whole law and the prophets hang on these two things. Now, do you remember what Jesus said? He says, what is the greatest commandment in the law? They were asked, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, well, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two things hang the whole law and the prophets. And so as soon as I got that, the Holy Spirit just opened my understanding and I had the revelation. And this, I believe, is really going to bless you. So the two commandments was this. <clears throat> the commandment was that we must love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and we must love our neighbor as ourselves. So, you know, when we hear these two commandments, we say, well, that was the summary of the law. And so we don't have to keep the law anymore. We just have to love God and love our neighbor. Well, theoretically, I want to show you and prove to you what God really wanted to say to me. Now, there were two things that the box was hanging on. They were hanging on two poles. And those two golden poles now actually represent the two things that the law and the prophets hang on. You know, we, we can kind of get confused when we think this, but when I show you the box hangs on two golden poles and the whole box with the two bowls are gone and only the top part, the mercy seat with the two cherubim are left, then you realize something then you realize the two greatest commandments are all based on the law. Because Jesus was asked, what are the greatest commandments in the law? How do you summarize the law? And so if we, are, if we really want to summarize the law, we will understand that the law and the prophets basically hanged on those two commands, to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. But later Jesus actually changed this in an amazing way. And he said this in uh, John chapter 13, verse 34. He says, I will give you a new commandment that you should love one another just as I have loved you, so too you should love one another. And by this, all men shall know that you are my disciples if you love one another. 
Wow. So Jesus says, a new commandment I give you. So what was the old commandment? Well, let's listen to what the new commandment is. He says, love one another as I have loved you. So what was the old commandment? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. So many people would say, well, I don't even love myself, so why should I love my neighbor? <laughs> but Jesus just lifts the bar and he says, listen, you need to love one another as I have loved you. Now, before you fall into the trap, today I want to reveal something to you which are two major differences. And if you understand this today, you will understand the revelation I believe God wanted to give me through this sign. There's a difference between the love for God and the love of God. You see, the love for God is what I must do is to love God. Have you ever felt that feeling where you, you really you, you live for God and you say you love Him and you live to the best of your ability and then you find out you make a mistake and you do something that is so stupid and, and you just sin maybe and, and you feel like, you know, oh my goodness, I don't love God. I thought I loved Him, but I don't. And then you feel guilty and you don't feel good enough. But you know, in 1 John chapter 4, verse uh, 17, this John tells us, he says, listen, perfect love drives out all fear because fear has to do with punishment. Because God first loved us. God is love. Hallelujah. And it's not that we loved him. It's he first loved us. And when we begin to separate these two things, we are going to begin to have a freedom that we've never had before. A lot of people try to love God. They try to show God how much they love Him. And then they find themselves falling short. And they feel so guilty. They feel so like, oh man, I just messed up again. And I thought I loved Him. Well, the truth is, your best deeds, your best efforts are filthy rags in God's sight, the Bible says. And the truth is that God actually loves you. It's not about your love for God. It's about His love for you. Hallelujah. So, I want to just end off here, and I want to read one more verse that really I believe is going to change your understanding and just seal it to give you understanding of the fact that there's a difference between the love for God and the love of God. But some translations have messed it up a little bit because they didn't see there's a difference. But in 1 John 2 verse 15, it says, John says, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Because all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. So there's two things you can have. You can have a love for the world, or a love of the world, or you can have the love of the Father in you. You see, the love of the Father is God's love that He has for the world. And if you love God, that, that's okay. God says, if you obey me, you will, uh, if you love me, you will obey my commands. And we kind of fall into a trap and say, I'm going to obey God. But God loves you. He loves you far more. Long before you loved Him, He loved you. Hallelujah. One of my favorite verses is Romans chapter 5, verse 5. It says that God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom He has given us. So if we understand that, we can just receive God's love, freely receive and enjoy His love. So I just want to praise God and I want to pray for you right now that you will have an understanding of the depth of God's love for you. And when you begin to fall into that trap of feeling, God, I just don't love you as I should. Remember the sign that God gave me, the supernatural sign, which God confirmed to me to say, you know what? It's not about the box. The box is gone. The only thing that's left is the mercy seat and the two cherubim. And in the future, we'll go into much depth of looking at what the deeper meaning is of those two cherubim with the mercy seat. Hallelujah. So, Father, I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Father, that you love us, Lord. Thank you that you've loved us with an everlasting love, as you told the prophet, Lord. And I want to pray right now, Father, for a lot of people that have felt like they are not worthy, Lord. They feel like, Lord, they, they don't love you enough. 
and they can never measure up. They can never be good enough and they just find themselves falling short. And I pray, Father, they will begin to realize, Lord, that you've loved them in spite of their sins, Lord. And Father, right now, I pray that the freedom will come over people and that they will begin to receive your love. Yes, thank you for your presence, Lord. Thank you that you come to, to break through in people's lives, that they may begin to receive your love, that they may begin to just enjoy the love of the Father, that they may begin to realize how loved they are, Lord. Yes, Lord, that they will, those who have not received your love, that they will just experience an impouring of your love into their hearts right now. Yes, Lord, the Lord just speaks to me right now and he says, I want to break the yoke. I want to break the yoke over my church. The yoke that has said, you must come and love me. You must perform to be loved by me. I love you. I love you unconditionally. That's why it's unconditional love. It's God's love for you and not your love for God. Hallelujah. Thank you for having listened and thank you for having joined us in this program. And uh, if you want to follow us, you can follow me on uh, Facebook at Hendrik Witness or on YouTube, Hendrik Witness. And uh, yes, there we have a lot of other teachings that can help you. And follow us on Patmos and go back to former programs if you've missed former programs. And just come and join us on this journey as we grow in hearing the voice of God. Hallelujah.